Oh, it warns me. Hello, this is Barry, and welcome to the Simplicity Zen Podcast. If you're watching this podcast on YouTube, please consider liking the video and subscribing. YouTube uses these metrics in deciding how widely to distribute the videos, so it would be appreciated and helpful. If you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, you can sign up for updates on the website at simplicityzen.com. Today, my guest is Brad Warner. He is perhaps best known for his widely read book, Hardcore Zen, and other excellent books about Zen Buddhism. His most recent book is soon to be released and is titled The Other Side of Nothing, The Zen Ethics of Time, Space, and Being. He also offers a popular Hardcore Zen YouTube channel. Thank you for being with us here today, Brad. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, sorry we uh, had to postpone this. We postponed this once. I guess the viewers at home don't know that, but uh, but now I'm here. So. You just ruined the magic. Oh, I ruined the magic. Yeah, yeah I'm just kidding. Uh, so uh sounds like you're in the process of moving yeah uh saturday is the day when the movers come and take everything away and we're almost ready mm -hmm. um are you upset i didn't um i didn't introduce you as the world's greatest lover <laughs> no that's no, all right yeah. it's all right you don't I, have to i, yeah, I that, think that's a reference i thought that was a great line in your book where you said like so calling yourself roshi is a lot like um telling people that you're the world's greatest lover right i thought it was yeah like, because, because Ro example. yeah roshi is often used in uh, american zen circles as if it's a, a title mm -hmm. uh, like a job title or something but mm -hmm. it isn't it's a in japanese it's an honorific and yeah we don't have an equivalent of honorifics really in japan in english i guess sir or madam is sort of the best we can do but in, in yeah. japanese a whole lot of them right and uh, and calling yeah, I, I guess maybe that's a good, uh, maybe it's a good analogy. You'd be like calling yourself, if I said I'm Sir Brad Warner, well, I guess if I was a, a knight, I could say that. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it sounds weird to, to a person who knows how to speak Japanese when people will say I'm, you know, John Smith Roshi. It's just like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, in fairness, it, it is kind of, it's a different meaning in America. So, the, yeah, it's so, weird, so, so yeah. I mean, if you really think about it, reverend is a weird thing to call yourself too. So, uh, so there you go. When people do that. I'm Reverend yeah. Warner. Yeah, you know when I when I think of people like, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Reb Anderson. I mean, he seems like a Roshi to me. You know, he's older and has lots of Dharma errors. And, I mean, but maybe that's just me as an, a, an American Zen practitioner. You know. Well, I mean, you you wouldn't in in Japan you wouldn't call Roshi literally means old teacher. So so anybody who's not very old, it, it sounds weird, mm -hmm. and and it's also yeah, it's also something somebody else calls you to be polite to you. It's not really something you know you call yourself. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I guess a guy like Reb Anderson would would certainly be Roshi material. Yeah. Um, so I, in preparing for this uh, interview, I, I looked at um, the Angel Zen Center. I noticed you're not on that website anymore. Are you not Angel City Zen Center? Are you not part of that organization anymore? Yeah, I, I kind of stepped away from that because it was, I, I, I don't want to be mean to them, but I didn't think it was going a direction I wanted to go in. So I decided mm -hmm. you guys just go do your own thing and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do something else yeah so it was maybe not the smoothest of parting then or not really no it wasn't <laughs> and i just didn't i just was like nah, i don't want to be in this anymore so yeah. yes sorry to hear yeah. um yeah so um you so you've been pretty busy with your youtube channel is that kind of your other than writing would you say that's your primary kind of dharma outlet these days well, yeah, it's it's the main. It seems to become have become the main thing I do, even beyond writing. Even though during the time I was writing this most recent book, I was doing uh, YouTube videos almost every day. So, uh, I and so I'm doing both, and then a little bit of traveling, but mostly the the videos. And I started that. Um, I started doing YouTube videos a long, long time ago, but very infrequently. You know, I just put one up whenever I felt the urge to, which wasn't very often. And then I started doing them more regularly. 
And then I just got into the idea of, of just making it, you know, putting myself on a schedule. So now I do at least three new ones a week. I mean, there's some exceptions, but pretty much every week I, I managed to come up with three new YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's, uh, and because of the nature of, of book writing and the way that goes, I don't get a lot of royalties from, from the books. So most of my income I, I think is being generated by people who see the YouTube videos and I have a link on the end of where to donate. And that seems to be where uh, the bulk of my income is coming from. So I'm, I'm devoting more time and effort to it. You know, trying to make it. And, and I've got this kind of um, cadre, I, I don't cadre, I've got an audience. Uh, which uh, which keeps getting bigger. It's not huge. You know, I look at other YouTubers and they've got 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. I can count on between one and 2,000 views per per video, which I think is, is uh, even though by YouTube standards, that's tiny, it is, uh, it's significant. So, uh, so I want to provide the people who watch it with something, you know, useful to watch, entertaining. Yeah. You know, I think part of it is, you know, both of us, I think, have been practicing Zen for a long time. It's kind of the center of our world. But but even if you step like one step out into the circle of Buddhism, I mean, Zen's a pretty teeny in America in terms of just raw numbers. You know, like I think yeah. the people who are involved with more generic Buddhism or um, like Vipassana style stuff, I, th I think that has just a lot more numbers. You know, yeah, um, I think so. I, I've never, I, I actually searched it. Uh, I don't know how a couple of years ago, probably now, uh, but I tried to find the demographics on that because I had, I thought like you did, people the the word Zen is very popular and people like to use the word Zen and you know there's Zen there's a Zen marijuana dispensary in West Hollywood here in in uh, Los Angeles so uh, you know you get Zen everything these days but when people are Buddhists in America I think the Zen the Zen faction is it may not be the smallest one, but I think it's smaller than than several. It, it certainly, I, I would say there's fewer Zen Buddhists than, um, the, what's that one called? Um, the Nichiren uh, group. Um, um, uh, geez, what the hell are they called? The Nichiren Buddhist, Buddhist group that's very, oh, uh, okay, the Nam yeah. Renge Kyo guys. Um, yeah, I've, I've actually been to their headquarters in San Francisco. Sure. Oka Gakkai, that's you've been to their headquarters. <laughs> yeah, they have a building in San Francisco I, I blundered into one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're uh, in Japan. They're kind of looked on looked on as being a little bit odd. There's there's Nichiren Buddhism, and then there's um, what did I just say? Um, Soka Gakkai. Soka Gakkai is the uh, sect of Nichiren Buddhism that's gotten a, a major foothold in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other forms of Nichiren Buddhism haven't. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in Japan, though, I think Nichiren Buddhism is fairly widespread, but Soka Gakkai is a minority within Nichiren. So it's all kind of, um, I don't know, it's, it's not proportional. It's much more popular here, I think, than in, than in Japan. I, that would be my guess, but I haven't seen demographics on, on any of that. I don't think anybody's done it. You know, they just lump, when they do any surveys on Buddhism, they just lump Buddhism as, as one thing. Mm -hmm. for america yeah, yeah re regarding like the the relative popularity of zen versus you know things like v v vipassana or you know or kind of kind of mindfulness order oriented buddhism i wonder if possible part of it is that kind of like the new the new person's in experience is kind of like all right this is a building there's a cushion sit down you know yeah and if in a couple of months this somehow resonates with you, you're welcome to, you know, ask somebody or or maybe we'll give you a class about um, you know, basic forms, but then there's your cushion, you know. And yeah, yeah. yeah and I'll just make my point real quick. And then whereas I think, you know, if you go to other types of Zen, a lot of it's like, oh, here's here's things that can help you right away. You know, oh, you're feeling sad or you know, or like here's some basic things that right away will make you feel better. I, th I think that's the way it's presented. I think it's just for someone just walking through the door who doesn't have like, hasn't like a burning fire from reading Zen books or whatever. I think it's, Zen doesn't offer a great newbie experience. And, I, and I've always wondered if that's part of its lack of uptake. Well, it probably is. I, the Zen tradition 
I think has always been like that. The the sort of stereotype for how one becomes a Zen monk in in China and Japan and probably all throughout Asia where there, where Zen is present mm -hmm. is uh, is you go to the monastery and you sit on the stoop and somebody comes along and tells you to go away and if you sit on the stoop for uh, you know several days in the rain and the snow and the heat and the, the tigers trying to eat you and whatever then they'll let you in uh, so the i so that's that the idea is it's not supposed to be super welcoming and i, I think americans then by comparison to me seems super welcoming you know and i and i realize that by if you compare uh, zen in america to i don't know the baptist church or the mormons or or somebody like that i don't know you know some sort of normal religion in our in our parlance uh zen seems very very cold but then if you compare american zen to zen in asia it seems warm and, and cuddly so mm -hmm. you know you have you have both sides but the, the idea of Zen is that you you kind of in order for it to work, you've got to you've got to you've got to come to it ready to to do it. It's not really, um, you know, meant to sort of lure you in and and make you feel good, and uh, and and it doesn't proselytize. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not so worried about the fact that it doesn't have. A, a good uptake, you know, that the, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy enough to, to, to talk to the people who were, who are really serious about it already. And I, I don't know if there's any point in going and trying to convince somebody, trying to sell it to them, because it's sort of, you know, Kodo Sawaki, who was my teacher's teacher, one of my teacher's teachers, um, famously said zazen is good for nothing or zen is good for nothing depending on the circumstances so you know that's definitely not you know that that's the he's not trying to sell it you know he's just saying it's good yeah. but 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 saying zen is good for nothing there's the whole i i made a video about this there's, there's a good reason to say that because it it uh, it is the approach of, of zen to be good for nothing you're not trying to use this practice to get to something else you're trying to actually get into the practice as the practice mm -hmm. yeah, the, the anecdote where i first heard that saying and i think it was uchiyama was talking to his teacher and you know uchiyama's teacher you know you know charismatic and i think physically strong and you know just a lot of energy where uchiyama is kind of mousy and kind yeah. of nerdy and like you know low energy and you know, and he asked his teacher, you know, if, you know, if I practice Zen and get enlightened, or I don't know how he phrased it, you know, will I be like you? And Ricardo was like, no, it's good for nothing. You know, I, I think that yeah. was kind of like the, probably. the original context of that, of that. Um, yeah, he probably, I mean, he said it, he, he said it a, a few times in different ways. So, yeah. Um, and I actually, I can't remember it now and it probably doesn't matter that much, but I used to know what he actually said in Japanese. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to give credit to um, uh, uh, Sho, Shohaku Okumura, mm -hmm. uh, because Shohaku Okumura came up with the translating it as good for nothing. And there's a story he tells that uh, when he first got to America, he was, I think he was picking vegetables for a living or something like that he was working on a farm somehow and the uh, the the supervisor was was talking about i forget what he was he, he, there were two berries that looked alike that they were picking and they and he was saying get rid of those good for nothing you know whatever berries that uh, and 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 only take the good the good ones that they were supposed to be picking mm -hmm. And that's where he remembered that phrase good for nothing and then he translated what Uchi, or what uh, Sawaki actually said in Japanese as good for nothing because there's no phrase in Japanese that directly corresponds to good for nothing. Uh, it's a, it's Do you remember a, what the more verbatim translation would be? No, no, it, uh, but it, it, it was a similarly colloquial sort of phrase. It was a it, um, it, it, it had a very similar meaning, but it just um, I think uh, 
Okamura just found the right the right words in English to convey that. And a lot of people probably wouldn't. I did I did a video or a blog or something where I, I gave my own direct translation of it, but that was years ago, so I don't remember. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll seek that out. Um, so your most recent book is about um, non-duality and ethics and how they intersect. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought it was really interesting, um, at least in the, the, a lot of the Soto groups that I've been involved with, um, you know, you know, a big rite of passage is Jukai, um, you know, kind of, you could, some people call, you know, translate as lay ordination, and, and you talk about the precepts, you read about them, but they're often, um, they're often uh, discussed kind of at a, from a, um, a relative perspective, you know, a, a real world practical perspective, yeah. I, I think at that stage, and I'm sure there's someone listening to say like, well, that's not how we did it, but I, but I think I've seen a big enough cross section where I think that's pretty accurate. Whereas, um, like in Rinzai and, um, uh, you know, White Plum, you know, the Yasutani, Parada Yasutani lineages, right. the last the last koans they do, you know, before you're finished with koans, is looking at the precepts from an absolute perspective. And so, uh. I, so I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it, and so the point being that, you know, that the, the absolute versus relative view of the, of the precepts is not that widely discussed in Zen. So I was so I, so I thought it was pretty cool that you devoted an entire book about it. What um what got you to decide to write that book? What 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 motivated you to even approach the subject like that? Well yeah uh, well let me see there's a lot in the question. Um, I I really I wanted to write another book after letters to a dead friend about Zen but I, I didn't have any great ideas and I spent several months working on what I never finished was a, a book about UFOs which sounds so weird um, and I'm not I'm not like a big um, UFO nut or anything but I started to, to I found that subject really intriguing and I thought there might be a Zen perspective to go with on this and I, I was like I don't know if anybody would read <laughs> a UFO Zen book, but I started working on it. And at some point, I just, uh, I felt I wasn't getting anywhere with mm -hmm. that. And it, it struck me just kind of looking at the world events and stuff, that a lot of people in the world are looking, for, they, they want to be good people. I mean, it's kind of a, a, a thing, you know, even, mm -hmm. even people who fall into terrible stuff like white supremacy or nazism or stuff they I, I think they're also looking for a way to be a good person but they get caught up in something that that defines what being a good person is in a in a really bizarre way and though that's an extreme example but i think there's a lot of uh, you know maybe endless uh, less extreme examples of people kind of falling for what is promised to be a, a set of rules or criteria to help you be a better person and to to do the right thing that are just that just don't make any sense when you when you pay any attention to them and, and just seem wrong and i i thought well what's the what is the fundamental thing that makes the buddhist precepts different you know because everybody when you hear the Buddhist precepts, when I first heard them, you know, when I was a, in my late teens, I, I, I thought they sounded like the Ten Commandments, but slightly different. I mean, some of them are, I think, in the book I say how many, because I actually counted it out, but I think like four of them, four of the ten are the same. You know, don't steal, don't kill, um, don't lie. I mean, these are the same in the Ten Commandments and the, and the Buddhist precepts. So you're, you're thinking, okay, well, this is kind of the same thing. But it's coming from a different angle uh, in, in terms of why. Why don't you lie? Why don't you kill? Why don't you steal? And in, in Christianity, you don't do those things because God says they're wrong, you know? And so you have to kind of in, in, imagine God up there who has his own ideas about right and wrong. And those are his ideas. And he's the biggest dude around so we better follow his ideas and a lot of people will tell you you know what god's ideas about right and wrong are and they're often you know wildly different uh, in, in buddhism there's no sense of 
well, I argued in one of my earlier books that there is a sense of God in Buddhism. I wrote this book called There Is No God and He's Always With You. But it's not a God in the sense of the biggest dude up in the sky who's got his own opinions on things and you better follow him because he's the big, biggest guy and he's the scary guy. Uh, it's more of a sense of there is a kind of universal uh, oneness or togetherness, interconnectedness of, of all things. And that fundamentally we're all the same. And so I don't, I don't think I used this phrase in the book, but one of the phrases I was trying to find a way or, or try, one of the ways I was trying to express this was it's almost a, um, a kind of selfishness in Buddhism in the sense that if you want to have the best life for yourself, then these are I wouldn't say the rules, these are the, these are your best suggestions. And then you hear are the precepts uh, because everything is interconnected and because doing something that is harmful to anybody else is ultimately harmful to the person who does it. And, and there are no exceptions to this. It always comes out that way. You can't, you never get away with anything. And it's not that God uh, sits up there and tallies up your wrong actions and punishes you for you know all the bad things you've done it's uh, it's that you you've brought this on yourself you've literally you know i i, I wrote that in the first uh, page of the book uh, you're always punching yourself in the face so stop doing that <laughs> yeah that, that i thought that i thought it was a great way to open it up because i mean it really sets the stage you know the non-dual aspect of it yeah and so that's all you're doing so any any time you think you're gaining something uh, in, in in a conflict with somebody else you're not gaining anything you, you know you just you might temporarily move the thing from one spot to another but that's all that you're going to do it's going to come back and it's going to balance itself out eventually and you're going to lose whatever you gain so so why bother? And if you want to have a better life, just stop doing that. Yeah, I remember um, I, it's one of your books, maybe your first one, where you wrote something where when you woke up on nine one one and turned on the news and you saw the um, you saw the attacks. I think your first thought was something like, I, "What did I do? Or what have I done? Or something like that." Yeah, yeah that kind of seems to have the same spirit. It's you, kind of you funny when you say woke up. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny that you say I woke up in the morning because I was in Japan when the September oh, okay. 11th, 2001 thing happened. And in Japan, it happened in the, if I remember correctly, it was like the early evening, like seven, seven o'clock in the evening or something like that. That's when the news broke in with, with all that stuff. Um, and yeah, that was my, my gut feeling was something like, oh my God, what have I done? I didn't, I didn't think of it in those words. But I, I saw it as as um, my instantaneous response was to to be like, oh, I did that. Um, not that I personally did that. You know, if anybody's uh, watching this and trying to, <laughs> I guess they're not tracking those guys down anymore. But um, not that I personally had anything to do with that in in the conventional sense. But in the more overall sense, uh, we're all involved in these things, and that's that's the sort of frightening prospect of, of Buddhism is, is how is, is, is that you see, you start seeing everything as in terms of your personal responsibility, which is one of the little things that, that, um, you know, you probably have to do a lot of practice before you, you get there. And, you know, it's not necessary for everybody to, to, to blame themselves for any bad thing that happens in the world personally. But but we're, the interconnection is very very deep, so we're all involved in these things. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, what I mean, what I'm curious, what what was it about ethics that made you? Uh, was there something you came across that made you think about it? Like, what was what was the seed that kind of made you interested in tackling this topic? You know, it's it's hard to say. It's something I've always been interested in. Um, th there was this kind of thing that was going on a few years ago of, of, of that somebody 
it was very uh, prominent on the internet Buddhist forums accusing me of never, uh, of, of not talking about ethics. And I thought that was so bizarre because I felt like I've, I've hammered that, that uh, aspect of the practice since the beginning. So I'm like, why are you in, and this, this person seemed to be obsessed with the idea that, that Brad Warner was, doesn't talk about ethics. I'm like, I talk about ethics. I never talk about anything else. That's why, that's what it feels like to me. Uh, so, it, and, and I got interested in Buddhism in my, in my late teens and I'd been in the, the punk rock movement. This is part of the story that, that anybody who's followed me knows already. And I feel like it's kind of boring to some people, but I've been in the punk rock scene, the, the hardcore punk scene in Ohio. And it was the, the little scene that we had there was very, very influenced by what was going on in Washington, DC with these bands who were into things like straight edge and all that, when, which straight edge was this philosophy of, you don't drink, you don't uh, do drugs, you don't have meaningless sex, you you live kind of this moral life. Uh, so and, minor threat, they were one of the big... Um, yeah, yeah. That movement, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were big minor threat fans. And, uh, and a lot of people in that, in that little cadre of people, which wasn't that many, you know, it was like, you know, I don't know, we, Zero Defects, when the band I was in uh, and still am in, uh, you know, a big show for us might be a hundred people showing up and we'd be like, wow, that's, that's amazing. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a big, big thing, but among that group of, of people who were interested in it, this, this idea of being a, a moral ethical person was really, really strong. And I felt when I first came across the Zen version of ethics, that this was, this was the, the taking it to the logical end you know of just saying okay you know what's the the true ethics you know and uh, so so i've always had that uh, interest in it and it just sort of doing a whole book about it seemed i don't know logical especially like i say seeing a lot of people who seem to be searching you know for doing the right thing i mean that's the whole the whole uh I, I don't want to ruffle too many feathers here, but the whole woke business that that uh, people are getting into is is often about an idea of doing the right thing, but it's but it's yet another version of the same almost religious mentality of the right thing is defined by you know some authority, mm -hmm. and they're going to tell you what the right thing is, and we're all gonna we're all gonna follow that. Whereas the the Zen approach to ethics is more. Uh, seeing for yourself at this moment what is the right thing to do mm -hmm. um could you could you choose maybe one or two of the precepts and kind of maybe given a like people haven't read the book given an example of what you like an example of like a non-dual approach oh gosh well I, you I, know I the, the, yeah the the um the thing I was introduced to very early on in, and that I didn't realize is, is a little bit uh, rare, was that my teacher, uh, Tim McCarthy, my first Zen teacher, was a, a big, he was a student of Koben Chino Roshi, and Koben was a fan of what is called the Bodhidharma uh, precepts, which uh, I did some research on for the sake of doing the, the book because they're, they're attributed to Bodhidharma, the legendary founder of, of Zen in, in China, the Indian monk who supposedly came and, and made it all happen. But they, they probably originated in Japan, uh, as, at least according to the research I was able to, to uh, dig up uh, much, much later, like in the, the 1500s or something like that. So, you know, a thousand years after Bodhidharma was dead, but attributed back to him. But they are these non-dual versions of the precepts. And so every precept is is reinterpreted. And I, I can't... That, are they called the formless precepts or something like that? They is might that be called... called some people, they, there are different names for them. Sometimes, um, I got the book here my, right, right now. Um, I, can, I can actually find one for you. Okay. Um, but yeah, sometimes they're called the foremost precepts, but they're all real interesting. Um, what's the vow not to kill? Ah, here it is. The, the one that's given usually as I vow not to kill is in the Bodhidharma precepts. Self-nature is mysteriously profound. 
in the midst of eternal dharma, not to give rise to the view of stopping and extinction is called no killing life precept. So, so it, it's, it's not just a invocation or invocation, uh, whatever. It's not just a precept that tells you don't kill anything. It's mm -hmm. telling you don't even, don't even give rise to the idea that killing, that, that anything can be killed. That's, that's how, you know, the person who wasn't Bodhidharma, but was writing in his name, reinterpreted the, the precept of, of do not kill. And, uh -huh. and so they all, they all point to that. Let me see if I could find the not to steal. I think not to steal is um, uh, self nature is mysteriously profound. And they always start like that in the Dharma in which nothing can be attained, not to give rise to the mind of attaining is called the precept of no stealing. So, so it's not just telling you don't steal anything. It's telling you there's no such thing as stealing, <laughs> you know, but, but usually these, the Bodhidharma precepts are, if they're taught at all, I, I was, it was weird that I got them right at the beginning, you know, that those were the among the first versions of the precepts I ever heard with the Bodhidharma precepts. But most, mostly they're left until much later because often they sound like they're contradicting the precepts. Like if, if, I, if I took this one about uh, um, not giving rise to the mind uh, of attaining anything, instead of thinking, do not steal, I might think, well, I can't attain anything. So I'm just going to go take my friend's power saw and, and keep it, you know, whatever. I, power saw is a weird thing to think, but you know, whatever, you know, you, you, you might get the idea that these are negating the, the, the normal, the regular version of the precepts, but they're not, they're sort of a, a, a way of trying to reframe them in that non-dualistic way. And I use the word non-dualistic a lot in the book, and I hate that word <laughs> because it just—it's one of these—it's um, one of these words that uh, every time the the word gets used too much, then people think they know what it means, and then it, it becomes um, it becomes silly. But it's a non-dualistic version of the precepts. Yeah, let's actually dive in there a little bit. So you know, non-dual, I think, was kind of popularized in the um, you know the the. Uh, um, is it Advanta? How do you pronounce it? I don't. Advaita, the Advaita Vedanta, uh, yeah, school I, within Hinduism uses yeah, the every, word a lot. Every once in a while, I uh, come across a word that I realize I've read a million times, but actually have never enunciated before. I yeah, think that was one of those situations. You know, because I like who would I talk to about that? But um, you know, could you maybe compare and contrast their view of non-dualism, non-dualism, if you understand it a little bit, versus maybe. The, the Buddhist perspective, if there is, maybe they're the same, maybe they're different. Um, I think you maybe even did a video about this once. Um, yeah, yeah, I did. I, I think they are quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I'm not sure my teacher, Nishijima Roshi, would, would agree with me or that or, or not, but I don't think he ever studied the Advaita teachers as, as deeply as I did. So, so maybe I'm right. Um, I don't know. But um, I, I think the approaches are similar. They're, they come from a similar sort of, uh, you know, they're both Indian philosophies. And the Advaita Vedanta is kind of um, probably influenced by Buddhism. You know, it's probably started off with certain people who wanted to, to not break off from the original sort of Hindu practice. Hindu is a kind of a misnomer anyway, but, but to kind of maintain the original form of the religion but understanding it in the way the buddhists did and so they kind of take the language but i mean that when you get when i read some of the the advaita people uh, particularly ramana maharshi and nisargadatta maharaj uh, those two they they sound like zen buddhists not just any old buddhists but zen buddhists often but th there's terminology differences and and for example one of the things that that uh, struck me is the the word consciousness and the word mind come up in both philosophies and it seems to me that what the advaita people call consciousness the zen people call mind and what the uh, buddhists call mind the advaita people call con no anyway vice versa they're they're backwards so mind in buddhism is this uh, great overarching thing that encompasses everything and consciousness for Buddhists is usually the individual consciousness. That's what they usually mean. Whereas it's reversed in the Advaita 
people will will talk about consciousness. They'll use the word consciousness to refer to the overall sort of big mind in Buddhist terms, and they will use mind to refer to the individual uh, mind. So, um, so there's that difference. But then once you get kind of get past some of the terminology, they're they're similar. And the the real difference in approach, I think, is um, the advice to people still hold on to the the guru system, which is which is one of those things that I imagine can work really well if both the guru and the disciple are very pure. I hate that word, but very pure in their aims uh, and, and very sincere. Hmm? Non-jerks. Yeah, non-jerks. Yeah. I think it can work very well because what you're supposed to do is to put your whole trust in your, in your guru. And Zen doesn't have this idea of you, you put all of your trust in your, in your Roshi and just follow exactly what he or she says uh, and, and don't question it, you know, that, and that seems to be um, <clears throat> the difference in the Advaita stream. They, they do uh, tend to advocate that method of, of working with things. So, um, and, and, I, and I feel like overall Zen is probably still got the edge, you know, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be uh, still stuck in the Zen tradition if I didn't think there was a, some advantage to it. But, uh, but I think they're, they're very similar in their, their uh, philosophy and their, their yeah. ideas about the nature of reality. Yeah. Uh, you can tell me if you think this is true or false. It, it, what I what I've thought to myself is one thing Zen I think has the upper hand in a lot of other traditions and maybe every tradition is a lot of traditions seem to go up to awakening, you know, the absolute all, yeah. is, or all is nothing. Where Zen seems incredibly skillful and even aware and maybe exclusively aware of the need to well, it doesn't stop there. That's kind of just the beginning. Now we need to integrate the relative and the absolute. And what what is the relationship of the relative yeah. and the absolute? And, and it, at least for me as a practitioner, that to me has been the magic of Zen. You know, because I mean, yeah, because it's not that hard to have a you know an awakening experience. But what do you do with that? And and I, and I think Zen is especially skillful in that area. But but I don't know a lot about non dual traditions, so maybe. Well, I, I, no, I think you are right. I, 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 and, and, and I don't know, Advaita is something that I've kind of looked into all, you know, here and there over the years, but it's only been within the last couple of years or, um, you know, five years or something that I really started to get serious about trying to, to study exactly what that's all about. So I wouldn't say, and I've never practiced in an Advaita tradition, but I don't see a lot in their literature about what you're talking about, about that, um, what do you do after, you know, that, uh, that sort of awakening, it's sort of, it, it's sort of kind of um, assumed that once you've had that kind of opening experience, then everything else should fall into place. But I don't think that's always the case, you know, uh, it certainly wasn't the case for me, you know, I've, I've had those experiences myself, and then, and then you can, you can have that. And one of the amazing things about the ego is that the ego can turn anything into fodder for the ego, you know, including the dissolution of the ego. You, you can turn the, the understanding that the ego, the, the ego self is a fiction and doesn't exist into something that you can, you can use to aggrandize your own ego with. You know, it's it's very ironic, but it's you know we're we're clever that way as human beings, and I, I think there's a there's a danger of that, and I think um, the Zen tradition has long realized uh, that particular problem, whereas other spiritual traditions seem seem not to have, you know, or they seem to kind of assume everything's okay after you've had that um, initial uh, moment of of realization which you know some of those moments of realization are incredibly profound and and can change you fundamentally but you know the the 
the ego is still very strong and you're you don't you know you don't just get rid of it by noticing that it's unreal it's it's still there and you can kind of yeah you can kind of go wrong mm-hmm. a lot of people have <laughs> mm-hmm. um and i hope this is not putting you on the spot or anything but um uh, so so you uh, you know a big part of your training and a big part of your writing is involved dogen yeah um, i'm curious is there anything that dogen said and i know you touched a little bit about it in your book but does anything stand out in your mind um that dogen has, uh, about dogen's approach to non-duality that you think you would want to uh, mention to people right now is, is anything kind of anything you know, dogen would say well yeah yeah it's it's um boy that's yeah i don't know i i, I don't know uh how to answer that exactly that, that he's Dog is an interesting character because he'll he'll say um, mind is fences, walls, tiles and pebbles. And this is one of his phrases that he he uses a lot. And I think that is a really interesting way to put it, because it for a lot of um, uh, a lot of the non dualist philosophies can get kind of dualistic in that they posit this uh, mind or consciousness that stands apart from everything else but dogen's idea was that if there is this mind it it includes everything so even it's not there's no um, there's no separation between mind and matter and one of the things i like about dogen is he always flips everything so even the duality of duality versus non-duality is something you're trying to even overcome that you know, in understanding that even your ordinary experience is an aspect of this non-dual experience. So it's not that you have an awakening experience in which you suddenly see everything as being uh, all unified. It's that you you also try to learn to understand your so-called ordinary mind as being also an aspect of this great non-dualistic um, universe you know so it's not it's not confined you know I'll, I'll, that's one of the the things you'll find in like a lot of koto sawaki's talks he, he talks about uh, satori because a, a lot of japanese uh, he was I don't, I can't remember his, when he was born, but he died in 1966. So he's, you know, his, his active years were mostly post-war until the the Mm sixties. And at that time, there was a lot of Jap interest in Japan in people wanting to have Satori experiences. I don't know if this was true earlier in Japanese history or not, but it, it was, it was very popular for people to want to have these awakening experiences. And that got transferred to the U S in a big way. A lot of people who, who first got into uh, Buddhism in the sixties and seventies in the U S a lot of their push was to have these profound experiences. And he's always saying that that the satori experience is is just um it's one aspect of ordinary life just as it is Mm -hmm. and so you're you're not um it's not that there is a special experience that changes everything even though there is but it's it's that all experience is included within this and i don't even remember what the question i was asking now (laughs) i think i've drifted oh dogen uh you know did dogen um Oh, did Dogen, from Dogen and, you know, on yeah, the Dogen, yeah, Dogen often emphasizes that he has this, this um, essay called Kajo, which is everyday mind or something is usually how it's translated. But he's mm-hmm. uh, he's talking about ordinary mind. Ordinary mind is the way. And most of us who get involved in meditation traditions are seeking extraordinary mind i mean that's uh, that's the, that's what i got into it for among among other things when i first got into it i was very interested in these extraordinary experiences and I'd, I'd done acid a few times before i got into zen and i thought okay this is the uh, the ultimate acid trip you know and i'm gonna meditate and if i do it long enough and hard enough or in the correct way i'll have you know the ultimate acid trip experience that will be you know even even fix more everything. profound yeah that'll fix everything and and uh, and you know you if you practice enough those experiences do happen but then um 
and you always end up back here. And that's one of the things I, I think is interesting is, is no matter how far out you get with drugs or with meditation or with any, anything, reality seems to drop you back off in, in here, you know? And so to me, that, that says that there must be something about here that is important. Uh, and, uh, and I'm not sure exactly what, what it is, you know, in, in, in words, but I can see experientially that it must be really significant, the most significant thing, because no matter where I've gone with this uh, meditation experience, that I always end up back here, you know, I always end up back in ordinary mind. So yeah. what's that about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like the, the more I've gotten into Zen or practice, and I didn't see it this way at all when I first started practicing. Um, even more than maybe non, like, you know, self and other, it's, it seems what causes me trouble in my life is t mental time travel, you know? Yeah. The, the past, the future, like that's always, it seems to be the, um, um, you know, the kind of the, the fulcrum yeah. that gets me into trouble and gets other people in trouble. And I've noticed, you know, the more I sit, you know, and, and even, I don't know, if even that's the right way to articulate it, but the, the more that I kind of, I think I get in the groove of practice, I've noticed that there's just less mental time travel, you know, and, you know, and, and so be here now and be in the moment, it's so cliche, it's kind of lost meaning, yeah. but I think really, you know, like this, this, like without the mental time travel, I mean, that really seems to resolve everything you know and, and it's yeah yeah and um so yeah so what you're saying totally resonates with me you know yeah yeah we do seem to have my dog just walked up behind me and i'm wondering what what he wants but but that makes me think of my dog because it does seem like uh, animals you know we're animals and one of the things animals can do is anticipate the the future and remember the past and, and even ziggy down here can do that uh, and and we as human beings have sort of we're really really good at that we're probably better at that than any other animal and it gives us a significant uh, survival advantage you know we that combined with the you know these grasping hands you know makes us the the dominant creatures on on earth and and we've really you know compared to most animals we're we're not we're kind of useless you know we don't have a lot going for us you know we just have these two things we have this you know ability to really manipulate things in a very fine detail and we have a an ability to anticipate the future and remember the past and to communicate with each other in detail about about all of those things mm -hmm. and so because we're so good at that and because it's 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 been so useful to us i think human society not just american society or japanese society or any particular society the whole of human society is very very focused on that because we realize that's that's our edge and and i think we've collectively gotten lost in it and not that it's a bad thing because i think it can be a very good thing and, and it can give us you know even insight into spiritual matters you know for want of a better word um this this ability but yeah we get we get lost in it we get we get we worry so much about the future or we worry so much about the past that it, that it occupies a huge amount of our awareness mm -hmm. you know it's constantly being devoted to past and future and we miss out on what's going on right in front of us because we're so concerned with past and future and this is the this is the ethical aspect too gets back to this because the ethics in buddhism are, are based on what's happening now you know and it's not based on some idea of what might happen in the future a lot of other ethical systems are based on that are based on sort of I don't know, trying to shore up things now to make certain that the future goes the way you want it to, you know, or the, or the unethical way, you know, you're trying to, um, you're trying to prevent something that hasn't, hasn't happened yet, or, or trying to, um, or, or what's in it for me, you know, what's in it for me implies future, you know, yeah. what am I going to get, you know? 
yeah, that there's that there's something to get, that there's something to gain, or or you know, you get lost in your own past and guilt over that. And you know, guilt has some minor usefulness in it, in that it might keep you from making the same mistake again if you feel guilty about having done it before. But beyond that, it doesn't do much. But you know, some of us are are very able to wallow in it forever, you know, so to where, uh, again, a huge amount of our mental space is, is occupied with feeling bad about something that, that can't be changed. Um, so, yeah. Um, speaking of time, I'm curious a little bit about, you know, kind of what is it? So you're no longer with the Angel City Zen Center. So that means, and of course, this fell away for a lot of us because of COVID. But do, do you miss the kind of in-person sitting and the services and the session? Like, do you see do you see yourself doing that kind of practice in the future, or do you think it's mostly going to be kind of this what you're doing now for a while? No, the the in-person thing is the only way to do it, and mm -hmm. and you know, doing doing things online is a really poor substitute. And I don't, I I think. One of the problems is uh, people, uh, especially after everything that's happened in the past two years, have gotten even more enamored than they were before with online and going, well, you can do anything online and missing out uh, on the fact that you really have to do these things in person. It doesn't, it, 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 you, you can do some things, but it's about, it's kind of like the difference between reading about a practice and actually going there and doing the practice. Um, you know, it's, I, I think the online experience of, of Zen practice is maybe slightly better than just reading about it, but it's not the same as actually going and doing it. And, and last year I, I was in Europe for a month, mm -hmm. going to uh, several countries, uh, leading sessions and, and talking to people. And I'm gonna do that in September. Uh, this year I'm already scheduled to do, to do several, um, things in Germany, England, and uh, probably France. Um, anyway, there's a, there's all these things brewing that I haven't got all worked out. So I'm going to go do that. And I'm moving and I'm already talking to a friend about establishing some sort of a, a sitting group out where I'm, where I'm moving and we'll see where that goes. Still Southern California? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's about 45 miles away from Los Angeles, but still in California. I had a, I'm married now, so I had to compromise with my wife and her, her family mm -hmm. is in Los Angeles and she doesn't want to go too far away. I would have gone, <laughs> would have gone completely out of this state, but, uh, but, uh, but we're staying here. Um, but, uh, but it's definitely not Los Angeles anymore. And, and I think it, things will probably be different out there. Um, in fact, I know, cause I just did my, uh, I just uh, applied for the water bill and it's like the difference between doing uh, getting on the water system in a big city like Los Angeles and getting an, on it on a, a small town where you just walk in and you're actually talking to the people, you know, and, and, and this yeah. is the person who's setting up your, your water thing. You're not going through a giant bureaucracy anymore. So it should be interesting to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, um, I just, as I was asking the question, I lost my train of mind. Um, oh, I know. Um, so do you, so when you write your books, do you, I'm curious, do you like pitch something to them and they say yes or no, or are you established enough at this point where they're kind of happy just to let you do what you want? Cause, cause for example, like you know, your, your book on Dogen, mm -hmm. like I thought that was great. You know your two books on the show Boginza, because I like I don't think most publishers would touch that, but they let you, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, I you guess know, they. You know, yeah. so I'm curious, like, what, like, have you got? Do you kind of have carte blanche where you can kind of write? Like, would they have let you do the UFO book? You know, uh, actually, they were interested in it. I did pitch the UFO book to New World Library, and they said, "Yeah, let's see what uh, let's see what you come up with." And then I didn't come up with anything, so I pitched them a different book. Um, so yeah, the, that, that's what I usually do. I usually, um, you know, work out an idea of what the book is going to be and then see if they're interested. And then um, I still write the book. Um, New World Library is a small publisher. So um, 
their their big claim to fame is they published Eckhart Tolle. Tolle I don't know if you pronounce the e at the end. Anyway, they published his first uh, big book, The Power of Now. But most of their other authors are kind of like me, the sort of mid level people who get you know we get we're popular enough that we get into the bookstores and things, but we're not the mega sellers. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but they're they're pretty happy with uh, so far with whatever I pitched to them. We'll see what happens next time. <laughs> Oh, I remember something I was going to say earlier. We were talking about in-person Zen versus not. Um, yeah. You know, I'm kind of a moderate on the issue. Like, I, a lot of the Zen stuff I do is online these days, and I and it's I get to interact with people I wouldn't get to interact with otherwise. But one thing that's really struck me about doing these interviews and kind of hearing about people's practice lives is almost exclusively what got people into Zen was meeting somebody, and it wasn't what they said. It wasn't what they were, yeah, you know, their ideas. It was their, it was their stature, their, you know, their energy, their solidness. Yeah. And, and it was like seeing them in person and just be like, wow, I want what that person has, you know? Yeah. And that I think is what's missing online. And, and so like, you know, my current teacher, we met for lunch and, and I got that energy off him. And, I, and I'm pretty sure if I hadn't met him, and we just interacted online, I, I, I never would have gotten that vibe from him. And yeah, I think that's I wouldn't yeah. be a student right now. And, and, and so that to me, I think is what's, what's most missing on virtual Zen. And maybe, maybe that's not the case for everyone, but that definitely seems to be a pattern in what kind of what draws people in the Zen is like seeing the embodied presence of someone who practices, who's practiced Zen for a long time. Yeah, that's de that's definitely the case with me. It was uh, it was my first teacher was really, yeah. There was there was something about him, and of course, there was no online option when I met him, or even when I met Nishijima Roshi for the first time. So there wasn't uh, there wasn't it, there wasn't a question of that. But really, seeing them in person and being next to him, I mean, there's a lot of things that I. I remember about both of those guys. I remember what they smelled like, you know, it's a weird thing, but n not that either of them was unpleasant or anything, but they had a distinctive um, like smell. You know? it's it's like, right? Not like they're yeah, stinky. Well, in Tim's case, he, at, I don't know if he still does this, but at the oh, time garlic. I met him, yeah, he was really into munching cloves of garlic. Yeah. And, uh, and he didn't really, it did, he didn't, it didn't it didn't smell on him the way you might imagine it was just this kind of weird smell that i always had every time i was around him that i didn't know what it was it didn't to me it didn't it wasn't something like an italian restaurant smell you know it was like this you know because he was chewing them raw i guess maybe that was different but um you know there was there was that and there was the incense and there was um you know one of the things about nishima roshi in japan is i i remember going to his office once to have a conversation with him and I was sitting there across this table from him and I looked and there was a, a teacup in there and inside the teacup was an old brown dried up tea bag. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is nothing, but it really, it, it was something I wouldn't have seen if I had, if I was trying to interact with him on Zoom or something, you know, mm -hmm. and you can hide all of that stuff and you can prove present a kind of uh, image of, of perfection and of, of the kind of person who would never leave a, a tea bag sitting in a, in a teacup for long enough for it to get dry and brown, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I remember his underwear hanging to dry when I was, uh, when I was having conversations with him because he, he was sort of living and working in the same little space for a while. And I can remember going in to have conversations with him and there's his underwear hanging hanging behind him as I as I'm talking to him about profound insights and if, if you're doing uh if you're doing it online you're going to miss all that you know it's yeah. not gonna you're not gonna get that uh, too much can be edited out you know for example you don't know that I'm not wearing pants uh, well, actually I am wearing pants but, well, this is the reflection. but you wouldn't know if I was them. I'm wearing a Flintstones shirt you probably couldn't see that though yeah. um so two more questions before we go. Um, one is, I'm curious, have you seen a UFO? Like what, what got you interested in it? No, I, I did see, uh, it's in one of my videos. There was something and it was about a year ago going over 
the the house and and I actually turned the camera around and got caught a little bit of it on uh, on video and it definitely was not an airplane it it was in broad daylight it might have been a satellite that was somehow reflecting enough light uh, for me to be able to see it in broad daylight that's the only ordinary explanation I can come up with for this thing because it was it was much too high in the sky uh, to have been an airplane um, but I've never seen anything uh, uh, better than that I just I think the you know, I'm, I've always been a science fiction fan and the, the idea of, of life on other planets, I mean, it, it seems like a no brainer that there must be something else. Um, and and uh, I started getting into reading uh, Jacques Vallée, who's a, uh, he's a, if you ever wanna read about UFOs, he's the most, probably the most difficult writer, but the most interesting because his, uh, his idea is it has nothing to do with nuts and bolts sort of, you know, uh, astronauts from Mars making metal spaceships to come to us. He, he kind of gives it an almost spiritual dimension of there's, there's some sort of other intelligent intelligence in the universe that is trying to communicate with us, but we're not, we're somehow not getting the message. Um, and we don't know what it is because it's so, it's, it's the way of understanding life, the universe and everything is so different from the human way of understanding it that we just, the, there's no common language, which I think is a very interesting idea. So it, it appears to us to do things that are absolutely absurd. And, and, and some of my favorite UFO, I, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna digress here. One, one of my favorite UFO stories that most people just toss away because they think, oh, this one's too ridiculous, is a guy in Wisconsin in 1960 has a story where he, he's, he just walked out into his, I think his front yard and this UFO comes down, right, you know, level to him, opens a door and this little guy comes out and offers him pancakes. And he takes, he takes one of the pancakes, eats it and thinks it's the worst pancake he ever tasted, but he keeps uh, two other ones. And then the UFO whizzes off and then he calls up, you know, the, uh, I think Alan Hynek, who's the famous UFO investigator of that era and, you know, has him analyze the pancakes and they don't find anything unusual about the pancakes. They just seem to be just very bland pancakes, but there's no, there's no reason to think this guy was making up the story. And he seems, there's even film of him telling the story that you can find on YouTube. Uh, and he's, he's not a very sophisticated man, but he, he's not making this up. You know, he actually had this encounter and this would fit in perfectly with Valet's way of understanding it because it's, it's something that's so different from us that it just, it, it manifests in ways that, that are absurd. So that, that was the angle I was going with for the UFOs was something like that. But yeah, I've never seen one. Yeah, I, I'll tell you about my experience real quick if you're interested. Oh, you got one. Well, I'll tell you anyway, even though if you're not interested. Um, I am, so I, I am. So I, so I was probably 17 or 18 years old or something. Mm -hmm. And my parents out, were out of town and me and a buddy um, were, out, were hanging out at my parents' house. And then these, his girlfriend and her friend were there too, but they were outside by his truck in my in my parents' driveway. And we were hanging out in the TV room and like he was standing and behind him were some like French doors and I was standing looking at him. Mm -hmm. And then like, all of a sudden, like, you know, when you're on an elevator and it drops down too fast, you, you get that oh, yeah. feeling in your stomach. Well, like I felt that like a really strong sensation like that in my stomach. And I, and I like, I bent over and like he bent over too. And then just at that moment, it's like red ball of light, like floats like just about this fast, like floats through um, the backyard. It's like vibrating and everything. I feel like it's like every molecule in my body in the room is like vibrating. Like it's almost like a sound, but it's more like vibrating. It floats away and he's like, oh, did you feel that? And I, and I said like, I saw that. And just then the girls come running in the house and they're like, you guys aren't gonna believe us, but these red balls of light just flew up your house, down, up your street, went around your house and then continued on. and like we were all completely sober yeah and yeah it, it was really weird like um i was hanging out with that same guy like maybe a year later or something um hi chris if you see this um and and he said you know isn't it weird we never talk about those red balls of light 
I'm like, yeah, right. but let's just not, let's not talk about it. He's like, yeah, it doesn't feel right. And, you know, and then I probably, it probably went like 20 years before I talked about it again, you know, but it was, it's easily the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Like I, maybe it was ball lightning, maybe it was some sort of military super drone thing. I don't know, but it was super weird. And yeah, the, yeah, but, but what was weird about it is like, it didn't seem like a ball emitting light. It seemed like a ball of light, if that makes sense. You know, it yeah, was like, that, that's it was interesting. Like liquid yeah. light or something. It was super weird. And, anyway, so I can't say I believe in UFOs, but weird stuff happens. I can. Yeah, weird stuff also. does happen. No, that's a really interesting story. And that's a lot of the ones I've, I've read about are, are similarly interesting. There's some stuff that it's, you know, there's a there's enough stuff that's hard to refute that you're going oh there's something going on and then and now with the government and the military actually saying yeah there is something going on that's like the first time that's happened which, uh, which tells you how weird this last couple of years has been you know yeah the government admits there's ufos and it's like third page news you know like, <laughs> yeah, yeah people are going oh yeah aliens whatever <laughs> yeah uh, so last thing i want to ask you and it's a little bit drier um so when, when I was doing my um, preset work, you know, the get ordained and stuff, the one I had the um, the biggest problem with that I just couldn't resonate with and still couldn't was the uh, not to disparage the the Sangha or the Dharma. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, unfortunately, I haven't gotten this far in your book yet. So I, I don't know what you wrote about it. But could you address that a little bit? And well, you know, do a very bait on what you did in the book. But I'd be curious to hear your view on that one. Yeah, I can't even remember what I put in the book but so so i'll have to do it um the other way um that that one i've always had a hard time with too because i my um you know i've always been okay with the buddha and the dharma but i'm like oh the sangha you know because i'm not a people person i'm not really very gregarious even though i you know make my living as a public speaker among other things i can talk in public without too much problem but hanging out with people i just have trouble with and that's what you're doing in, in a Zen group is, you know, you're hanging out with the Sangha. I mean, even though you've got, you know, some purpose in mind, you're, you're still with all these people. And, uh, and not disparaging it specifically, I, I wrote a, um, a blog years ago before I had a book out called Buddhism Sucks. And it was about, it was about how I was looking at a lot of the things that were referring to themselves as Buddhism and how I thought most of them were not worthy of of any any real interest um and this is a this is a sentiment i think my uh, teacher shared the nishijima roshi definitely shared because he was kind of he he could be hard on a lot of other buddhist groups and a lot of things that sort of claim to be buddhist but he really objected to that blog title like he said i shouldn't title that you know i, I should change the title and i should not say that because that is a violation of the the precept of not disparaging buddhism um and disparaging the dharma and i thought well yeah i guess you taken literally yeah that is and i think there is some there is some usefulness in taking even though i go into these kind of weird ideas about the precepts these non-dualistic ideas there's also uh, uh, a value in taking them literally and just being like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to take this literally and follow what it, what it says and not disparage Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, who knows why it might've had a initially a kind of utilitarian value because, it, you know, people who are going around disparaging it are, are not good for, for, you know, they wanted to kind of spread the word and they want to keep people from doing that. So they make it a precept. So there's probably an aspect of that to it, which seems very mundane and almost a little bit um, cheap, you know, if you look at it that way. Um, but there's, there's also, you know, holding a kind of reverence for it is, I think, useful, you know, just saying that this is, this is something that, I'm not going to disparage, but at the same time, you know, you all, you, all, uh, you also have to have the willingness to call out abuses of it and things like that. So you don't want to, you don't want to take that precept. There's a, there's another precept that's um, usually given is don't, uh, uh, don't criticize Buddhist monks or lay people, something like that. Uh, and I learned it differently, but that version I've I've seen instances where I'm pretty sure um, 
different masters, so-called masters have gotten away with a lot of bad behavior because there's a precept against criticizing, you know, a Buddhist monk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's particularly strong in, in, uh, in certain organizations where people have kind of uh, dodged a lot of things that way. But yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I never liked that one either. It's not, it's not among my, my favorites, but I try ever since getting kind of reprimanded by my teacher. And that's probably the only time he ever, ever did anything that was even close to a reprimand. He was not that kind of a person, but, you know, so I knew it was important to him if, if he was going to do something that he didn't ordinarily do. Um, so, uh, you know, I do try to revere it, but then, then again, there's so much stuff that's called Buddhism, which I have no patience for. <laughs> so I don't know. I probably, I probably could be accused of uh, disparaging Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha because of, because of that anyway. Cool. All right. Well, um, I know you got a, your vivid, so I want to respect your time, but I want to thanks uh, for uh, coming here. Spend yeah, some thanks time for having me. Yeah, is there, uh, before I go, is there anything you want to say about the book or practice or any parting words? No, I guess I should plug the book. It's called The Other Side of Nothing. And and uh, it, nice if people went out and bought a copy and, and put it in the million seller ranks. <laughs> I kind of doubt that's going to happen, but, you know, it might. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then I'm always on YouTube as Hardcore Zen. So uh, YouTube.com slash Hardcore Zen. And I have a blog at hardcorezen.info and I haven't, I was, I went back to keeping up with the blog a few months ago and then I fell off the wagon again. So I haven't put anything new up since like February, but um, I'm going to go back to, to making sure the blog, but the blog is, acts as a sort of a hub. Everything else is kind of accessible through that. So if you go to hardcorezen.info, you can find all the other stuff that I do online. Um, was hardcorezen.com taken? I'm curious why you did that .info. Yeah, that's uh, that's complicated because I did have hardcorezen.com for a while and then I let it lapse. And then the next time I tried to get hardcorezen.com, it turned out somebody else had it and oh, they were okay. willing to sell it to me for a, a, a lot of money. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend that kind of money on, on, a dot com address so yeah so so instead it's hardcorezen.info and hardcorezen.com i think if you go there it's just some um, you know one of those pages that's not really anything yeah. a lot of your videos are you answering people's questions what's your preferred way of people getting in touch with you yeah if you go to bw brad warner bw at hardcorezen.info that you can send me an email and i take a lot of the questions from the emails i get at that address so uh, bw at hardcorezen.info. Great. All right. Well, thanks so much. And I uh, yeah. hope you have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye. Bye.